uh, Hanukkah and uh, redeeming of captives goes hand in hand. Uh, what I want to uh, speak to you tonight about are uh, two main themes. One is Kol Yisrael Arevim Zelazeh. Every uh, Jew uh, is responsible one for another. Um, because that is, uh, in, in essence, that's what uh, Israel is about. Um, wherever people are, wherever a Jew is around the world, if he's in trouble and if he needs to be taken care of, then uh, the Israeli IDF or the Mossad has a long arm and will get to anywhere. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's me uh, and my wife living in a um, small moshav in the hills of uh, Jerusalem, or you here in Hoboken, New Jersey, or if you're a Jew in the, in the Himalayas and Dar Dharamsala in India, uh, we're all connected, we're all one neshama, and it goes back uh, to uh, Mamad Hal Sinai, we were all there together. So we're all one, and Kol Yisrael Arevim Zelazeh. And the second idea is about the shining light that each one of us has, especially on Hanukkah, it's a good time to talk about it, and uh, we all have incredible potential. Uh, I'm 53 and only starting to begin to understand what this world is, is about. And um, life is very exciting. And we all have incredible potential, much more than we even imagine. And the idea is for all of us to realize our potential and to light a single candle that will glow very strongly for, for everyone and eventually to be and for us to be a light upon the nations. And that's what uh, we can do when we all join forces together. And my life is, um, if we're talking about Hanukkah as a time of miracles and uh, redemption from darkness to, to light, I have to say I, I am blessed and uh, uh, my life is like a, whole, a series of little miracles that happened along the way. And uh, people who, who took care of me and a guiding hand that uh, led me really to uh, uh, miraculously, against all odds, to uh, be able to survive and, uh, and succeed. And I'm very thankful for that. And I want to tell you about some of those stories. I was born and raised in New York City. Um, my mother was a Swedish convert. And um, my grandfather, being the professor uh, at uh, JTS, arranged for a quick um, uh, giur for my uh, Swedish uh, mother, even though, as you know, it's my name, uh, Cohen, it's a little bit uh, complicated, but he managed to pull it off. And um, my father, unfortunately, was a compulsive gambler, and um, he uh, passed away when I was six years old and left um, my mother, a Swedish convert, widow uh, with two kids, alone in uh, New York City to fend for herself. And uh, she had actually promised Grandpa Boaz that we would get a proper Jewish education. He knew to ask her and not my father. And so he asked uh, his uh, daughter-in-law, the Swedish convert, and she promised. And after uh, my father passed away, my grandfather also had passed away, she could have, um, she had two choices. And she decided to go back to Sweden to take us there, to be close to her family. and. Um, we went to Stockholm and I studied there in third grade in the Anglo-American school there. And I remember my mom taking us to, to different schools, to Jewish day schools there, and checking them out. And after seeing a whole bunch of schools, she said to us, no, this is not good enough for Grandpa Boaz. This is not what he meant by a proper Jewish education. And after one year there, she brought us back to the States, back to uh, Jewish uh, schools that we had started in and fulfilled a promise. And um, due to my mom's integrity, I ended up uh, where I am now and not being a Swedish mountain climber. And, um, <laughs> and luckily, we, as I said, we, we had no money. My mom really literally walked the streets with her head down looking uh, to see if she could pick up any uh, change on the, on the sidewalk. And uh, miraculously, we were taken in by Ramaz High School who uh, decided to give us a, a scholarship, financial aid, my brother and myself. And I always knew we got financial aid, but I only found out in my 30s the extent of the financial aid. 
In those days, Ramaz cost $9,000, which is the equivalent of today about $50,000 a year. And um, it turns out that we paid $25 a year tuition. So that between the two of us, uh, both of us got one of the best Jewish educations around for a whopping sum of $200. And I am deeply, deep, deeply thankful to Rabbi Lukstein, uh, who took us in under his wing. And um, that's one example of someone with a, who really took care of us. And miraculously, um, I ended up getting that education. I played for the high school basketball team. I was uh, the captain of the varsity. And uh, in a championship game, I hit uh, eight for eight foul shots in the last minute. And um, they said the, the heading in the, uh, the, news, the school newspaper the next day, was, we played against Flatbush, if you guys know. Uh, the heading was, the bush burneth as the ice man cometh. <laughs> and, uh, and there it was. That was my nickname, the ice man. And uh, since then, it, uh, it stuck. There he is, the ice man. And uh, the truth is, my career as the Iceman started at the age of six when my father died. And that was it. I shut down, no emotions, cold as ice, and really, uh, it served me well on the basketball court and later on, but I'll tell you about the evolution of the Iceman. I came to Israel for one year after high school for a one-year program. I'd never been to, to Israel. I was supposed to go to Brandeis uh, on a scholarship to play ball. And uh, I figured, okay, just take one year. Uh, on the way, and uh, I just fell in love with Israel. I discovered uh, something incredible, the connection to Am Yisrael, Eretz Yisrael, something greater than myself. I fell in love and decided to stay. And um, at a, one of those moments, you know, you have these, here and there in life, you have these epiphanies. I had a moment like that in uh, November 1982, one of the worst uh, tragedies in the IDF, uh, there was uh, the IDF headquarters in Lebanon, in, in Tyre, Lebanon, Tsur, uh, was hit by a, a suicide bomber, and 74 soldiers were, were killed in one shot, and they had uh, an unprecedented mass funeral at uh, Har Herzl in, in Jerusalem, and uh, they buried dozens of soldiers at the same time, and I somehow found myself uh, at this funeral, it was actually my first funeral. I, I wasn't even at my father's funeral when I was six. And here I am at this funeral, and there are literally thousands of people walking down the aisles, converging on the graves, screaming and wailing and, and crying. And everyone there was Am Yisrael mourning. And there I was, not knowing what I was doing there, what my connection was. I felt out of place. And at that moment, I realized what Israel is about and what it means to be Israeli. Every single Israeli knows somebody, either a family member or a friend, a neighbor, a teacher, who's been uh, a casualty uh, of war in Israel. That's the Israeli reality, unfortunately. And I understood at that moment that if I want to feel that Israel, that I have an equal stake in Israel, then I also have to be willing to, to risk my life to defend the state of Israel. And I decided at that moment, that's it. I'm not going to be a ball player. I'm going to um, join the Israeli IDF and try to spend as much of my life defending the state of Israel. Little did I know that it would end up in a, over a 30-year career of uh, really being very involved in, in various defense positions um, and really having the, the privilege and the honor to, to serve. And at that moment, I made that decision. And I went into the army, and I figured, okay, what do I do? I want to do, be all you can be. And, and um, I tried to get into the Israeli Air Force to be, to be a pilot. I was told that's the, that's the most uh, difficult thing to get into. And 95% um, of uh, the applicants fail along the uh, two-year training program. But I figured I'll give it a shot. And I ended up... Uh, in the training process, uh, while they, tr they tell you which unit you're going to go to, they laughed at me. They said, uh, you're, not, uh, you're not even listed here. You're, you're a new immigrant. We don't, uh, usually, it takes two years to, to test you until we can decide if you're going to get into the Air Force Academy or not. And uh, they told me none of the elite units are available. I said, well, what can I, what's the best I can do? What can I volunteer to? They said, you can go volunteer to the paratroopers. I said, okay. 
I volunteered to the paratroopers. And uh, after about three months there, uh, I started getting used to the idea that uh, I'm going to be a paratrooper, and I was already proud. And then I injured my, myself, my uh, tore a ligament to my, my ankle, and the doctor told me, that's it, you're no longer combat. We have lowered your profile from 97, which is like a 4.0 GPA. We're lowering it now to 64, which is like a 2.0. You cannot be combat under 65. Here I am, I volunteered to serve for two and a half years in the army, and they tell me your new job is to be a Xerox clerk. I kid you not, they sent me down to an Air Force base, showed me the Xerox machine, and they said, you're in charge of that, you've got 24 hours to show up and start photocopying. Uh, you must be kidding. Nope, that's your job. I went home to Jerusalem to my apartment, I was, now I can say, in retrospect, I was clinically depressed. You can imagine, I'm doomed to photocopy for two and a half years after having my dreams set high. And as I'm getting my bag, ready to leave the, leave the uh, door, I take a glimpse to the uh, mailbox and I see there's an envelope there. I cut out the envelope. It says here, your challenge is in the Air Force. See the, the colorful F-15s? It was an envelope with an invitation to come do the flight school checkups to see if I was uh, eligible to be a pilot. I said, well, I called them up. I said, you must know that yesterday they lowered my profile to the 64. You must know, because the Army knows everything. And I said, oh, well, <laughs> we didn't know. Um, but you know what? Come and we'll check it out. We'll see. The orthopedist said, no way. You are not going to be combat. Your ankle is in bad shape. I get to the final doctor who has to make the, the decision to integrate all the details. This is 33 years ago. The doctor's name is Dr. David Forecast. Okay? <laughs> a, Br a British Olech Adash who happens to be sitting there in that seat at the right time, in the right place, meeting me, speaking English. We get a good thing going. He's impressed by my motivation. And he says, you know what? There's no such thing as 64 profile in the Air Force. You're not supposed to be in the Air Force, but I'm really impressed with your motivation, and I'm going to give you a shot. He signed me in. He said, well, if you get injured in the infantry training of the Air Force uh, flight school, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> and he let me in, and Dr. Dave Forecast literally redeemed me. Can you imagine the darkest, really one of the darkest moments of my life, clinically depressed, imagining that I'm doomed to be a, a Xerox clerk, he turned me into a pilot in the Israeli Air Force. Is that crazy or what? It's a miracle. <laughs> really, it is a miracle. For years and years, I've been thinking about Dr. Forecast, wanting to thank him, and I tried to look him up. I didn't manage to find him, but I finally heard that he had uh, returned to, to England, and he was uh, a doctor there, and a year ago, they invited me uh, to a, a Chabad uh, synagogue in uh, London to give a, a lecture there. And a few days before I get on the plane, I was like, London, London, forecast, London, forecast, London. I got to find him. I find him, and I show up. I rock up at his door in the clinic, and I bring him a gift, a pair of Israeli Air Force pilot wings. This pair of wings. It's not, okay? This pair of wings. I gave it to him in a box with a uh, dedication. I owe these wings to you, Dr. Forecast. Your caring sensitivity was wind beneath my wings. He was blown away, okay? You can imagine. Dr. David Forecast changed my life, and I had the opportunity. 33 years later, to thank him. He really was so blown away. He said, I will cherish these wings. You have no idea. My dream was to become a pilot myself, he tells me. And in the meantime, I ended up marrying a non-Jew. And I left the country, and now I have a son who's not even Jewish. But these wings, I will cherish them, and I will pass them on to my son. Okay, and I'm like, whoa, this is amazing. Not only that, I said, Dr. Forecast, I want you to know, you went out on a limb, 
And you were right. Not only you took a chance, but you were right. Not only did I finish the, the course, became a pilot, but that same ankle that uh, the orthopedist said, no way, you can't even be combat. On that ankle, I ran 130 kilometers, 80 miles in an ultra marathon and did the Ironman and, and thank God it held up, no problem. Not only that, but you changed my life and my way of viewing people as a professional because I ended up becoming someone like you in charge of human resource selection process for the most elite soldiers in the army and defense forces in the Shabak and the Mossad. And you taught me to see people not as a number, but as a person. And I also go out on a limb sometimes and see them as a person before I make a fatal decision to change someone's life. And so Forecast had an incredible uh, influence on not only on my life, but on other people's lives. And that's the ripple effect of giving. And I think also part of what I said about Kol Yisrael Arivim Zelazeh, he looked out for me and, uh, and it paid off. And thank God, because of Dr. Forecast, I became a pilot and um, it was a tough course. I ended up flying, uh, I was a helicopter pilot. I flew uh, many uh, search and rescue operations in Israel, abroad, rescuing civilians and soldiers. Check this out. <laughs> the Iceman. Okay. I flew as the Iceman. You've got a mission going into Lebanon, wounded soldiers, you gotta go in under fire, tracer bullets, cross our paths, doesn't matter. You go into the landing zone, pick them up, evacuate them to the hospital, drop them off. I don't even look back. I don't know their names. I don't know if they survived or not. You're focused on the mission, no emotions. Another mission in, the, uh, in Hebron, in the, one of the intifadas, one of the uprisings, a teenage boy, Palestinian, violently uh, demonstrating, throwing rocks and Molotov cocktails. He ends up getting a, a rubber bullet in his eye. I end up evacuating him to the hospital. Very gory scene in the back of the helicopter. Don't look back, don't look him in the eye. I don't know what happened to him. Focus on the mission, the Iceman. I stood at funerals of my friends, pilots who crashed and burned, literally. I stood there at the, at the funeral stony-faced, no emotions, the Iceman. Until I realized I'm starting to pay a price. Somebody accused me of being an emotional cripple. And I realized, okay, I gotta do something about this. And I decided to try to get in touch with my emotions. And little by little, first under the cover of darkness in a movie theater, I allowed myself to shed a tear. Well, you know what? This isn't so bad. It actually feels good. So I allowed myself to come out from the darkness, raise the visor, let people even see my eyes, shed a tear when they see, and I'd be willing to take off the shed, whoa, shed off the armor, touch, be touched, I can be in touch with that. Before that, I was like in a, in a bubble. And I realized how amazing it is to actually be in touch, to touch and be touched. And thank God I managed to get in touch with my emotions and eventually <laughs> was able to have a, a real relationship um, with Orit and my three children. And that's because I, I managed to uh, go through that process and I had the, the courage to to make a, a change. And that's another transformation that I, I went through. And I, for me, that's another redemption from darkness to, to light. I call that the, the melting of the Iceman. And that's what happened to me in the Air Force. And I eventually, that led me on a path to study psychology, first degree, second degree, clinical psychology. And I became uh, a clinical psychologist uh, in charge of uh, not in charge of, but um, specializing in PTSD, combat PTSD, warrior psychology, and working with the most elite uh, units and helping them prepare 
for combat and to how to help them come back and cope with their with their scars um, after being traumatized in combat. I eventually became the head of the psychology department um, in the prime minister's office, which is in charge of the, all the operational workers of the Shabak and the Mossad. And one of my responsibilities was to prepare them for worst case scenario, if someone falls in captivity, and to prepare them and give them POW training. And this is something that um, leads me to to the topic that's connected to Pidyon Shvuim and a topic that's very close to, uh, to my heart because I, I feel like I, I've been there, done that, and I know it from many different angles, also as the pilot who went through POW training and also as a psychologist training pilots and other uh, elite uh, commando units to prepare for it. Also treating people who came back from that situation, POWs and their families, and also as a hostage negotiator um, being uh, prepared for situations like that. And Pidyon Shuim, I want you to know, is considered by the Rambam, Maimonides says that Pidyon Shuim is the most important mitzvah. The number one most important mitzvah, according to the Rambam, which is quite astonishing because it's actually not even mentioned uh, as a mitzvah in the Torah. But the roots of uh, the Jewish value of Pidon Shvuim and the state of Israel and what the state of Israel stands for come from the Tanakh, already from Avraham Avinu, when Avraham Avinu decided to go to war against four kings in order to save one single person, his nephew Lot. That's where it all started. That's, that's the source. Afterwards, in Bamidbal, in Parshat Chukat, they mentioned the story of... Um, of Israel going to war and Rashi says that because there was somebody taken into captivity, who is that person? One person, a female slave, one female slave, a shivcha. And Bnei Israel went to war, not only any old war, but um, Israelis know the expression of, it's called milchemet choma. I, I never knew the connection. Milchemet Choma, if you ask any Israeli what Milchemet Choma means, it means all out war. It's like all out, no holds barred. It's like the worst possible war. And only recently, when I started delving into the topic, did I understand why it's called Milchemet Choma, because it happened. That story of in Bamidbar, in Parshat Chukat, where they, uh, this Shifcha was taken into slavery, was in Choma. That's where it happened. Okay, and so B'nai Israel went out and asu milchemet choma in order to save one single female slave. Unbelievable. And of course that tradition continues in modern day Israel where Israel is willing to do anything and everything needed in order to bring our boys home. Even if it's just one boy and hopefully alive, but even if not alive, to bring him home to Kevel Yisrael, that is uh, the utmost uh, value. And uh, Israel has gone to war uh, many times as a result of uh, people, uh, soldiers being taken into captivity. Uh, of course, the most uh, famous example is uh, Gilad Shalit um, in Aza, uh, 2006. Um, Israel went to war. Afterwards, the second uh, Lebanon war also as a result of three soldiers being uh, abducted on the northern border. And um, not only wars, but Israel has waged uh, or engaged in uh, military campaigns and operations, risking many lives of Israeli soldiers in order to get information or bring back uh, our soldiers, of course, uh, and also civilians. The most famous uh, operation like that is uh, Entebbe, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. But there are many other operations that people are less familiar with and they're classified. And uh, I had the, the privilege of being part of some of those operations, and I want to share some of that with you uh, to give you a sense of how Israel 24-7 is always uh, thinking about and uh, looking for and risking Israeli soldiers' lives to look for our missing soldiers. And we still have some missing soldiers to this day, uh, the most famous uh, being uh, Ron Arad, who was a, uh, a, a navigator of a phantom jet 
shut down in 1986. And um, you can see the actual um, operation to rescue uh, him and his pilot. Unfortunately, uh, Ronarad, the navigator, fell uh, into the bushes and the, um, the terrorists were already on to him very quickly. But this is the picture of the pilot, uh, Amiram, who was uh, scooped away by a helicopter at the, the last minute as the terrorists were firing on, upon him and, and the helicopter. And he, uh, they managed to uh, fly him away like that, hang on to the skid uh, to safety. And um, unfortunately, Ron Arad uh, was uh, left in, uh, it was taken into captivity. And uh, that's a scar until this day, but there's, there have been many, many operations. One of them uh, being um, the ab uh, abduction of um, Mustafa Dirani in Lebanon. My squadron flew in uh, an elite commander unit from Sayyid Matkal in the middle of the night and uh, they came in and uh, pulled him and his wife out of bed and the uh, instructions were very clear. The, the goal of the operation was to take him alive in order to get information about Ron Arad. So therefore, uh, it was of utmost importance that, uh, that he be taken alive. And as he was being uh, pulled out of bed, he, uh, he pulled out a gun and um, my former commander of the, my hostage negotiation unit uh, was the one who, uh, who wrestled with him and decided not to shoot him, even though uh, he risked his life uh, and, and was almost shot by uh, Dirani's uh, pistol. But it was of utmost importance to take him alive and to bring back information. Another mission like that, uh, I was involved in personally. I was sent um, deep uh, behind enemy lines, uh, deep into Syria, um, to an area where there was, uh, they suspected that Ron Arad was being held by the Iranians. Recently in the news, you may have heard that uh, there's a lot of talk about an Iranian uh, base or Iranian presence in Syria, which is uh, considered to be a new thing and a dangerous thing. But I have news for you, it's not new. It's been going on for decades. Uh, Iran has been very active and very present in Syria. And uh, they, sent, uh, they sent us on a mission. It was so classified that we weren't even supposed to know what we were looking for. And they told us to look for any uh, signs of Iranian presence, maybe symbols, flags, and an Iranian uh, base. And, uh, and they said, you know, and if you see somebody maybe walking around in the courtyard with, a, with a, an overall, like a flight suit, that's, let us know. All right, what are you talking about? And the, uh, the young uh, intelligence officer said, I want to I was like, whoa. I, at the time, became even more motivated to do this mission. And um, we went in uh, very, very eager. And um, unfortunately, we didn't uh, find him. We found uh, Iranian presence, but, uh, but he was not to be found. And um, it's been years since 1986, and Onan is unfortunately still um, in captivity.